Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome today to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin, and I am the director of the Southern Fire Exchange Program with the University of Florida. Thank you for joining us today. I am excited about our presentation today with Dr. James Martin, Associate Professor at the University of Georgia. Today, Dr. Martin will be given a presentation on the relationships between northern bobwhite quail and fire. And this is a topic that I've wanted to feature on one of our webinars for a really long time. And I can say I am excited to have Dr. Martin with us today. So this webinar today is a collaborative effort in partnership with Mr. Steve Chapman from the National Bob White Conservation Initiative. And Steve, would you like to say th a few words today? First, I wanna thank Dave uh, Godwin and Southern Fire Exchange for hosting this webinar and James Martin for uh, agreeing to be the presenter on it. But I, I wanna real quick, before we get into the meat of the webinar, just tell you a little bit about what NBCI is. It's a 25 state unified strategy for Bob White restoration and is the first ever unified multi-state effort uh, to restore bobwhite quail on America's landscape. It was created by the state wildlife agencies comprising the core of the bobwhite range and is funded by those state agencies, uh, the Federal Aid and Wildlife Sport and Fish Restoration Program, the University of Tennessee and, and other, other sponsors throughout the years. MBCI is charged with developing and coordinating the implementation of a national habitat-based approach for the landscape scale restoration of huntable populations of wild bobwhites. And uh, thanks to all of you who are participating in this webinar today. I uh, hope, hope you're able to get something out of it. All right, Dave. All right, thanks, Steve. Thanks for your work in the region and your partnership in, in bringing this webinar on board today. I would I'd like to take just a quick moment to share a little bit of information about our program, the Southern Fire Exchange. We are a regional program for fire science delivery in the Southeast. We're a collaborative among the University of Florida, Tall Timbers Research Station, North Carolina State University, and the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. We're sponsored by the federally funded Joint Fire Science Program, and we are the southeastern branch of the nationwide Fire Science Exchange Network. Finally, if you're joining us today from an area outside of the southeastern U.S., please look into connecting with your local Fire Science Exchange Network. These are the folks that are working to connect regional managers and researchers to address local fire science issues and make differences on the ground. You can visit firescience.gov uh, for more information. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. James Martin is an associate professor in the University of Georgia Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. He directs the Game, Bird, and Managed Ecosystems Lab that studies the interactions of wildlife and managed ecosystems. Specifically, his work focuses on northern bobwhite ecology and management throughout the species range. Much of his work is in collaboration with Tall Timbers Research Station in Tallahassee, as well as numerous other state agencies. Most importantly, he and his wife, Navina, raised three young children, Scarlett, Ada, and Gus. And together, they also maintain a kennel of dogs, which he says some of them are useful, homing pigeons, and they dabble in beekeeping. So James, thank you so much. We're glad to have you with us today. And just one moment, everybody, as we swap out presentations. Well, I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to probably uh, not have my video on, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, trust me, you're not missing anything. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, talk about Northern Bob Whites and Fire, a perfect match. Uh, like I was introduced, my name is James Martin. I'm an associate professor at UGA. Uh, this talk had significant influence and contributions from Theron Turhune at Tall Timbers as well. He's one of my regular collaborators and uh, he's contributed to this presentation a great deal. So I'd like to thank him as well. Appreciate everybody joining on a 
busy schedule. Today is our first day of classes here at the University of Georgia. So it's uh, everybody's a little bit on pins and needles here today, but I'm glad to be talking about fire. So the real perfect match between fire and quail, we have to start here, right? You know, uh, if you never had quail on the grill, this is really the perfect match. Um, but that's not really what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, I'm not a chef or cook, but uh, you know, this is uh, sort of the ultimate outcome of good fire management and, and good hunting is uh, quail on the grill. I want to kind of impress upon you that um, I'm not just an egghead. Uh, Clay Sisson would say that I am an egghead and that's true. I do live in the ivory tower, uh, but in my younger days and several uh, pounds ago, I uh, did practice prescribed fire. Uh, during my dissertation, I burned approximately 30,000 acres of land and 10,000 acres of that I was burn boss on. Uh, guys like Sam Van Hook and Wayne Taylor that might be on this call helped teach me how to burn down in Central Florida and Osceola County. Um, so I understand the perspective that the practitioner may have as well in addition to the science that is done. So the first point um, I want to make this morning, or this afternoon, excuse me, is that uh, we need to respect our elders and history prescribed fire and quail. And here we have Stoddard, uh, very instrumental in starting this idea that fire is a tool for quail. Uh, you know, Na Native Americans used fire obviously before Stoddard, mainly for wildlife, but he really integrated science into it in the early 1900s. So we, none of us really would be here today studying quail and fire if it wasn't for Stoddard. And then we have a picture of Sam uh, Van Hook and then Wayne Taylor, again, that taught me a lot about fire. And those traditions of uh, teaching new people how to burn and how to burn for quail are super important. Stoddard in particular said that Bob White should be probably uh, called the firebird. So closely it is linked ecologically to uh, fire in the coastal ecosystems or pinelands. And he, he wrote this in the memoirs of, of a naturalist uh, in the early 1900s as well. And then later in the 90s, uh, there was kind of a, a rekindling of this idea that uh, fire is super important for an ecosystem here in the Southeast and, and beyond, and particularly with Bob Weiss, Brendan et al in a paper in the Transactions of Wildlife uh, Proceedings uh, with other authors really pointed this idea out and made this uh, biblical reference that whether fire goes, wildlife will go. And that's mostly true, if not 100% true for quail. There are areas that we have quail populations that aren't managed with fire, that are managed with other proxies of disturbance like disking or grazing or, or something of that nature, but fire really in the Southeast United States is so important for Bob Whites. And as we can see, hopefully you can see this laser pointer, you know, Bob White populations, this is no news to anyone, I don't think, but have to continue to decline ever since we've been collecting data with the Breeding Bird Survey since the early, uh, since the 1960s. So fire is a part of this restoration initiative to get quail back on the landscape. So in addition to, to articles like that, we have other historical data that really help us understand the ecosystem that this bird evolved in. From fire scar, fire scar data that Kevin Robertson uh, and, and others put together, we see that fire return intervals for a lot of the areas that they surveyed in the southeastern coastal plain, we see that there is a, a most of the fire scars show that a two-year fire return interval for the trees that they sampled. So it really gives us a window into where and how uh, this bird came to be. It evolved in this system that was frequently burned and so its behaviors, its physiology, its population and ecology is specifically adapted to deal with this disturbance that occurs on a frequent basis. So a little bit more historical, there's a paper I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, that came out about uh, 20 some years ago by Frost. Uh, sorry, it doesn't show up that well here in a slide, but 
the general idea here is that in the southeastern United States, we have anywhere from a one to three fire return interval. This is historic. Uh, you know, if you move north and towards the Appalachian Mountains, of course, we're going to have a, a longer fire return interval that might only happen one out of every hundred years. And then also, um, historically, it crawls more arid environments. You would expect maybe fire on any given piece of land to might not happen as frequently because there's just no, the biomass just doesn't accumulate on, the, on those landscapes as much. We're, we're going to focus most of the talk here today on this part of the world, east of the Mississippi River, um, and there obviously can be some linkages made between what we learned about the southeast, uh, but I just want people to, to know that they're kind of any time I mention a prescription about fire, I'm talking about this general area. And then as you get further west, you need to really con consult with people that are on the ground fire managers so that they can, uh, you know, give you the most on, up to date on the ground information for that part of the world. So part two or point two I want to make. Uh, so point one was this idea of history matters. Point two is that the biology and the ecology of Bob White and the associated plant community is extremely important. We're burning for a animal species, oftentimes, in this case quail, or a community of, of plants and animals. But we need to specifically, if we're focused on Bob White's, focus on their biology. One part of their biology that's super important, and I think this is a way that you need to uh, think about how you go about setting fire prescriptions is, first of all, is habitat ecology. Uh, I'm going to talk more about this diagram here in a minute, but the, this idea that quail habitat is made up of shrubs, grasses, forbs, and bare ground. And at the center of all those components, if we have the right combination of those, uh, we have what's called their habitat or their niche space. But in addition to that, we need to consider predation as well. Uh, how you apply fire is going to dictate survival of birds because you're removing cover, albeit it may be temporary. Uh, so you, we need con to consider predation as well. Fire is really a paradox when it comes to quail management and, and really for a lot of animals. It's simultaneously a destroyer and a restorer. And we want to focus more on the the restore side and not so much on the destroyer side. So in addition to the habitat aspects and the predation aspects, that will dictate our fire frequency, our fire scale, and our fire season. And if we do all these things correctly, what we hope will happen is that we have a population that will increase dramatically like the tall timbers population has done over the last 20 some years. Uh, to a point where it's really as good as it's ever been. And, and frankly, in the last couple of years, this population has continued to grow and it's just as good as it was in the early 1970s. But because of some uh, issues with fire management in the 80s and early 90s, and among other factors, this population uh, was sort of suppressed. And with viewing quail management through this lens of habitat management and, or you know, managing of vegetation, and predation management, you see this population is really responded. And that's what we want to do. We want to maximize the, that population. So let's have a crash course in Bob White population ecology. Okay, we have a calendar here, January through uh, December. Bob White breeding season, uh, you know, they start breaking up in March, and especially in South Georgia and North Florida. Uh, they're going to start nesting in April into May, and they're going to have broods throughout June, July, August, and even into September. We even have some, some broods in some years uh, in October as well. And then you have this winter period here in the orange. Uh, so we have a breeding season that includes nesting and brooding, and then we have an overwinter period. So let's say, for example, that we have a population of 77 birds on a, any particular site. Uh, those, what we want those birds to do is survive and reproduce, uh, recruit more young uh, all the way from this March period all the way back around to the next March. Well, uh, they, those adults need to survive throughout the breeding season through this blue phase. 
And in this particular year, 42% of those birds survive. Of those 77 birds, they produce 4.3 chicks per hen, let's just say in this particular year, and 42% of those chicks make it to the fall. And then once they get to the fall, they have the 54% uh, percent chance of making it through this following year. Okay, now if that was the case, we would end up with 92 birds the following year. Um, our populations increase. And we can go through this multiple iterations and just see what I want to impress upon you is that small changes in these percentages and these survival rates, anything with a percentage here is a survival rate. This Again, this is the breeding season survival. This is the winter survival. And excuse me, this is the chick survival. And this is winter survival. And this is the number of chicks produced per hen, 3.5 in this particular year. We see that very small incremental changes make these this population go up and down. And fire management or any type of habitat management for quail, we want to uh, make sure that we're maximizing those vital rates so that we can grow that population. And what we know from monitoring the tall timbers population for uh, 40 some years is that recruitment, this recruitment parameter, this is the number of chicks that survive uh, through from hatch all the way to the following spring per female, we see that as that number increases, the growth rate increases. Anything above a one means that population increased. Anything below a one obviously means that, that population decreased for that particular year. So recruitment has a strong relationship with that population growth. So does survival or annual survivals, say for an adult, but it's not as strong. So what this tells us is that in most southeastern population, and not all, there's obviously going to be exceptions to that rule, that recruitment is going to be the driving parameter that's going to dictate whether or not that population increases or decreases in any given year. So fire should be viewed through this lens of how do we recruit more birds from one year to the next. So transitioning to habitat ecology, again, which of, of course is related to population ecology. Birds aren't able to survive if they have no food or cover. And this again is a, a simplification and perhaps overly simplistic uh, graphic about quail habitat. Um, you know, I, I was sitting in, in church a while back before COVID thinking about uh, the Methodist quadrilateral and uh, don't tell my pastor, but I was thinking about how that related to quail. Um, uh, daydreaming about quail in church. Uh, again, don't tell the pastor, look my wife. But I really thought about, okay, quail really, if you get it down fundamentally from a vegetation standpoint, there are four constituents, four key components. We have grass, we have shrubs, we have bare ground and forbs. Okay, quail habitat kind of occurs simply in this green area here, where we have a mix of all of these things. We need grass, preferably a native grass species. We need shrubs, we need bare ground, and we need forbs. And in some particular places, say, consider this um, picture on the right here, is that it's a, it represents a subset of that habitat. So a place that really is ideal would fill up this entire space. So think it is almost as three-dimensional that the better the habitat, it really fills up all of these components. So this particular area on the right, it does a pretty good job of that. This is some South Florida rangeland that was burned uh, about, about a year before this picture was taken. The shrub component here, in this case, is wax myrtle. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of forbs here, but it's a little lacking on grass. Um, and so that's why this bubble doesn't completely fill up the green circle. This particular uh, pine savanna in South Carolina that Paul Grimes with Tall Timbers helps uh, manage uh, or, or gives consulting advice on really fills up that volume of space. It, it really kind of checks all those boxes. Okay, so it fills up that green circle. Whereas this one, uh, this is on a public area in Florida. Uh, you see that the circle that represents this area over here has too much of a shrub component and maybe not enough forbs and maybe not enough bare ground. So the way I would view that is we need to apply fire to help shift this circle back over. Uh, you know, we need to time our fire 
applied in such a way that we're going to shift that circle back into what's optimal for quail. And then this one uh, kind of suffers from a, a different problem. It has a lot of grass and a lot of forbs, but no shrubs. Uh, this is a, be a native warm season grass planting where shrubs haven't been, um, a, you know, really allow them, they haven't been uh, in existence long enough to really uh, be an important part of the stand of grass. So when we apply fire here, we would apply in such a way that might would help uh, encourage shrub growth, for example. Okay, so that's kind of a cr crash course on quail population ecology and uh, habitat ecology. Again, fire plays a key role in managing habitat for quail. Point number three I want to make is that we want to be principled, not prescriptive. Okay, what do I, I mean by this? Um, if I get a call from a landowner and they ask me how they should burn for quail without seeing their property or seeing the stand of pines or seeing the, the grassland, I can't really give them a prescription, but what I can do is speak about principles, about fire, frequency, scale, and season. I need to see that stand to write a prescription, but I can talk to them about principles, about how we apply fire. And some of those key principles here, again, are fire frequency, fire scale, and fire season. I think of this as like a triad uh, in, in a triangle where uh, fire frequency is the most important. It's at the bottom, it's kind of that foundation, it's fire scale being second, and fire season being third. All of these things are important, but again, I think most of the issues, and most of the management should be geared towards getting the frequency right, and then the scale right, and then the season, okay? We know that fire frequency really dictates plant communities. These uh, pictures from the Stoddard fire plots on tall timbers. Uh, this, this study has been in, in existence for 50 years or so. And we see that with annual dormant season burning, you know, burning every year, probably in January, February, before bud break, we see that we, we have a very grass dominated community. Whereas uh, in a two year fire return interval, we have more of that uh, quadrilateral represented for quail in this particular picture. This picture was taken in the winter, unfortunately, so you can't really see the forbs all that well. Uh, but trust me, during, during the breeding season, there's plenty of forbs, especially with legumes in this particular uh, stand. Whereas if we just change that fire return in one year, uh, we see that we start to get a shrub, too much of a shrub component, and we start to develop a mid-story, which is not what we want. The mid-story really provides no resources for Bob Whites. Uh, as a disclaimer, you know, there's definitely variations and, and gradients of, of how fire return it will, uh, or what the fire return interval should be. If we're dealing with a Xeric site, uh, then we might can drop back to a three year fire return interval. But in my experience, that's very rare east of the Mississippi River. Uh, you know, if we're talking about a sand, uh, a sandy site, uh, we might can go to a three year fire return interval, but you have to be careful with that because once you miss that third year window and get into a fourth year, you can have some particular issues. So how does this relate to the biology of species? Uh, th this is to me one of the most striking figures that we can have for quail. This is tall timbers. Every dot there is a telemetry location. There's 236,000 of those. Uh, if Bill Palmer's listening, he'll probably tell you that he collected most of those, but I can tell you that probably only about 10 of those uh, were collected by Bill. A couple thousand of those is probably my own from back when I was an intern. But there's a lot of telemetry locations. This particular area right here is called NB66. NB meaning no burn since 1966. And we can see that it has very few quail locations in it they avoid it, they don't like it. It hasn't been burned, it's a, it's a oak, hickory, magnolia forest now. There's only been uh, 312 locations of quail out of, that, out of those 236,000. Only 1%, uh, less than 0.01% of those have been locations when 
the quail were actually alive. So 95% of the locations that exist within this particular area is when the bird was dead. So this is where quail go to die, or this is where hawks bring them to eat them. So this is what we call a quail death trap. And it's because there is no understory. This is where predators hunt from. And it's a striking example of what can happen when we take fire off the landscape. We've done some research in the low country of South Carolina and with fire return intervals, this is on a, on a property where we had telemetry. And you see that as time since fire increases, that the general trend here is that, let me go back a little bit, that as fire return interval increases, the probability of use by broods decreases. And that's because quail chicks operate on this level. You know, they're uh, the size of your thumb. So to get through this hostile environment, they have to be able to move and they have to be able to forage and they can do so uh, most optimally when it's been burned that year, okay? Here's another example of that on tall timbers. Uh, this is for adults. You can see that right after the burn season, they burn mostly in March and April on tall timbers, that a lot of the locations for adults are in unburned areas, but after the year goes by, uh, they're using those burned areas more and more to the point where you get to the fall, they're using the burned areas of that particular year more so than un unburned areas. This is for nests. A lot of people think that quail only nests in areas that are kind of rough, you know, two years rough or older. It's not the case. It makes sense that early in May, again, this is when most of the burning occurs, is in April and May, but by the time May comes around, 20% of the nests of that particular month occur in burned areas, and that increases throughout the breeding season. By the time you get to July, almost half the nests out there are gonna be in an area that was burned that spring. For broods, as I mentioned before, uh, we see a lot of uh, use of burned areas for broods. That increases throughout the breeding season. By the time we get to September, almost 70% of all brood locations are in a burned air for that particular year. I think you, you start getting the point that during the breeding season, early in the breeding season, yes, they don't use those burns as much, but by the end of the year, those burns become super important because they're providing a lot of insect resources and it's easy to move around in and they can get to seeds that were from the previous year. During the non-breeding season, this is again from that study in South Carolina, we see that they do like a little bit heavier rough, you know, that two to three year rough on this particular site, um, and which makes sense. This is going to provide overhead cover for quail, and uh, so yeah, that's all I want to say. So breeding season, they're in those early burns, fresh burns, you know, something that has been burned less than you know, five to six months. And then in the winter, they sort of transition. They like to be in areas that have more of a shrubby component uh, and, and thicker for overhead cover from hawks. So that's fire frequency. Let's talk about fire scale. Next part of that triad. I did a, a quick and dirty analysis a while back. Um, I wish I uh, would continue on with this particular project, but, but I didn't at the time. But this graph is pretty impactful in my mind. Uh, I took some data from public and private areas across uh, Florida, and I just put them into categories, okay? Uh, not really considering anything else, if the average burn size is 1,500 acres and all the way up to, you know, if you're burning on 75 acres. And you can see quite strongly that if the size of the burns, the average size on, on the property is, greater than 1,500 acres, we have a lot fewer coveys per point than a 75 acre burn size. So it's really important to juxtapose burn blocks, such as this one here, uh, versus unburned blocks. And you do so by keeping your burn area small. This is from some of my dissertation work. Uh, similarly to that previous graph, this uh, solid line is for small burn blocks. In this case, the lower here is the better. So the hazard rate is lower for small, for birds and small burn blocks. We can see throughout the course of the year, 
the hazard rate, you know, goes, is consistently go, going up because quail are constantly dying, but they, they do so at a lower rate on areas that are burned in a small fashion versus a medium or large. In this particular study, me, medium or large was 150 acres or, or larger. So again, smaller is better. This is another study that we wrapped up a year or two ago on a public area in South Florida where small and large were quite different from each other. We had 200 acre units on one part of the property and then 2,000 acre units on other parts of the property. Uh, and we see that in general, across uh, the four years of study, when you pull those estimates, birds on the small blocks, at they sur their survival was 40%, whereas it was 31% on the large areas. So that's a, about a 9% difference in survival, which I think is, uh, you know, biologically important. This is during, just during the breeding season. So scale is important. And I realize that if you're managing 10, 20,000 acres, that you likely have to burn in larger blocks that are optimal for quail. And, and I get it, I understand that. Uh, but from a science perspective, I'm just here to tell you that there is a diminishing returns in burning bigger if you're managing for quail. You can burn larger, uh, and it may look good from a vegetation standpoint, but you're removing a lot of cover for quail in one period of time. And that removal of cover is causing their survival to go down. Again, remember what I said earlier, that fire is a destroyer and a restorer. And in this particular case, if you're burning too big across too much of your property, uh, then you're destroying too much at one time. So the last one here, the triad is fire season. Uh, again, I think this is the least important, but doesn't mean it's not important. And I don't want you to get so much hung up on growing season versus dormant season. In quail management, we wanna be more surgical than that. We wanna burn uh, in a more prescriptive way that's maybe talking about burning in a particular month. Uh, we wanna be more surgical than just that dichotomous uh, nomenclature of dormant versus growing. So we know that if you burn uh, different times a year, you get different fire behaviors, you get different vegetation response. All of these uh, have a place in quail management. I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you know, if you don't have any quail and you're trying to restore an area, then you need to apply fire judiciously uh, you need to apply it in a way that's going to get that vegetation back and not so much worry about the survival of the birds because they're not there. Once you get birds start colonizing the site, then you can really um, start being more uh, surgical about timing and, and, and scale. But, you know, early on in that restoration phase, uh, we just want to get fire on the ground so we can start getting that vegetation kicked off. But people, uh, the question that really comes up about fire season is nesting. Uh, this is a histogram of nest on tall timbers throughout the, the breeding season. The blue bars are incubated nests and the red line is the initiated nest. And we see during this red box here that if we burn during this area all the way up until May 15th, that we're really only destroying, if they are nesting in the particular areas that we're gonna burn, that we're only destroying about 10% of the nest. And even if we extend that window all the way to the end of May, we are only destroying 20% or less than 27% of those nests. Now, this quail nest multiple times. Uh, they can re-nest if nests are destroyed, even if they have a successful nest, they uh, produce multiple clutches. So even if we're destroying these first couple nests, they're going to re-nest, and that's a good trade-off to make if you need to get fire on, on the landscape. Don't be so rigid with your burn windows. Say, well, I can't burn after April 15th because that's when quail are nesting. If it needs burning and it'll carry a fire, that probably means that for quail, it's better that you burn it, even though it might be a nest in there. Don't delay it because, uh, delaying another year probably has more negative consequences uh, than burning one up, you know, burning one or two nests up. 
Also with Season of Fire, this is, uh, again, for some of my dissertation research, this is that cumulative hazard function. Again, they since capture here on the x-axis, cumulative hazard on the y. Again, higher the hazard, that means it's, it's bad for quail. Uh, we see that the lowest hazard is if that area was burned during the previous growing season. Second is pre previous dormant season or the current dormant season. Kind of among those groups, if it was burned this current growing season that has a higher hazard than burning during uh, the previous growing season. So you can see even among these four different groups here that there's trade-offs in different timings of fire. If it's never burned or, you know, impossible to burn like a, a wetland or, or something like that, you see that the, the survival is uh, the worst or the hazard is highest for those particular uh, burn blocks or lack of burning in this case. So what this, this tells us is that, you know, it's okay. There's some trade-offs of burning different times of year. But again, if you need to get fire on the ground to maintain that frequency, there it's fine because next year, that previous growing season burn, even though this year it may ha increase their hazard, the next year is uh, something that was burned 365 days ago is actually going to have lower hazard than it did uh, at the time that it was burned. So the point is get the fire on the ground. Another aspect of timing or seasonality of fire is this idea of burning so that we don't uh, put birds in a bind with regards to predation. We recently wrapped up a study that looked at hawk migrations in South Georgia, North Florida, and for your moody oak hawks like red tails and red shoulders, you can kind of see these oscillations of populations. So the growth rate here is the increase in hawk numbers. In South Georgia, we get a flux of hawks in February and then they leave. You see they show up, they're coming back through, and then their growth rates go down, meaning they're leaving that area during March. And so the timing of really the burn season for quail is perfectly timed to that, or currently is perfectly timed to uh, avoiding that really influx of hawk populations. I think historically, maybe fire managers wanted to burn more so during this winter period, but removing that cover when most of the hawks are going to be there or moving through that area, it really creates a situation that puts quail uh, in, a, in, a, in a bind. And we want to avoid that. Similarly, if we look over here in November, we get those hawks coming, you know, coming back or coming down for the first time. And that's also when we don't want to burn. We don't want to be exposing quail to predation during that November, November period of time. So to kind of summarize this triad, uh, we'll go through this again. Frequency is, um, should be dictated by the productivity of the site so that we maintain the appropriate composition of grass, forbs, shrubs, and bare ground. That's the principle, okay? That's the principle. Prescriptively, I can tell you that for most areas in the Southeast, a two-year fire return interval is probably gonna be the best prescription. Again, there's always gonna be variation to that. Uh, someone will inevitably send me a picture after this talk with a site that probably should be burned every three to four years. But as a general prescription, every two years. As a principle, burnt smaller is better. There's no question about that. There's a diminishing returns if we're burning areas across our landscape fit, that are greater than 50 acres. I'm not saying that burning 100 acres or 200 acres is not good for quail. It's better than not burning at all. I'm just saying that the maximize quail abundance and really fit your burning to their adaptations, we want to burn less than 50 acres at a time. From a principle, timing will depend on the predator populations and the vegetation response to fire for a particular season. If you get good vegetation response by burning in May for your particular site, then I would suggest that you burn during early May. 
Um, don't burn all of it in May, again, because we want to maintain that fire frequency of having one and two year roughs out there. But if May is when you get that plant community for your site, the best, then that's when you should burn. If it's best in late March, early April, then that's when you should burn. Also considering the, the timing of uh, halt migration and, and so forth. Be surgical about it. So to kind of put this a little bit more context, you know, in general, if I manage, if I were managing a 100,000 acre property and I knew that I couldn't get all my burning done at exactly the right time, uh, and, and I had, you know, obviously a lot of burning to do, we want to uh, be on the left-hand side of this graph where uh, any particular year, the white part is what's not burned, the orange may be burned during the growing season, and the, the gray might be burned during the, the dormant season. Again, just a general rule of thumb, you want to create sort of a checker checkerboard pattern across this landscape. Not to say that landscape C is not good for quail. I'm just saying that it's not as good as A. C is a far be better than if it was all white and there was no areas being burned. So again, A is better than C, but C still may meet some of your population objectives for quail. I wanna to transition to point number four really quickly. Uh, about reintroduction of fire. Some of you may be working with areas that haven't been burned in a long time. Most of the areas that we work with, burning has occurred there for centuries and consistently so, burning every one to five years. So that's a big, uh, that's a whole nother ball of wax uh, than, than having a stand that maybe hadn't been burned for 40 years or 20 years like this one in the picture. This is a stand we burned recently in the spring uh, that had been burned in probably 15 or 20 years. So by introducing fire to those, these stands, you're gonna get a different response and you have to be a little bit more patient with it. We have a study where we're introducing fire back into these stands, as I mentioned. We're doing so in combination with timber thinning. Uh, we have three different levels of timber thinning, a 40 basal area, 60 and 80, because canopy cover and, and pine stands will dictate obviously sunlight to the ground burning in an 80 or burning in a stand that looks like this one on the far left is really not going to do anything but remove pine needles. We need to, in addition to burn, we need to create sunlight. But even by doing so, uh, this is two years of results from this study. We can see the amount of full cover that was there before any uh, burning had occurred. And then we, in the second year, we applied fire to half of the stands and uh, we didn't burn the other halves. And we see that obviously it makes a lot of sense that once we introduce fire to those stands, we get more forbs here in red. Um, it, whereas in the, the green boxes where no fire was applied, we have a lot less forbs. And we see that forb cover goes down as canopy cover or basal area increases. So sunlight and fire, super important. But because these stands are super early, we still haven't made quail habitat yet. We have some forbs, yes, but we still only have five or 10% bare ground out there. So one fire is not gonna restore the vegetation or the plant community as a whole to, uh, for, to make quail habitat. It's gonna take more. There was a study recently, or actually in the 1990s that was done where they introduced fire to uh, parts of Arkansas and Oklahoma, I, if I recall correctly, uh, you know, where they had a control where they didn't do any timber thinning at all or fire. This is um, uh, on timber uh, improvement stands that burning had occurred one year prior, timber improvement two year prior, timber thinning and fire three years prior and this is timber thinning with no burn at all. So you can notice that you, because this was a reintroduction of fire into those stands, it took three years or so to really start to get a population of quail here in the, the, the pink and the uh, teal dots here that would even compare or start to be more so than not having any fire alone. Uh, obviously all of these are better than the control 
but we don't really see the benefits of fire in these stands where it's a, it's a new event until two or three, four or five years afterwards. Uh, and so it does take time. If, you've, if these stands have not been burned a long period of time, it's gonna take some uh, restoration phase. And my last point here is that landowners will need council and financial incentives to complete prescribed fires. I work with landowners and I know the Quail Forever folks work with landowners that really have stepped away from the application of fire on their landscapes. They may be new landowners that uh, have no history of, of burning uh, and that culture may have been lost at that particular site. And it's nice to see that uh, seminar coming up about the culture of burning. I think that'd be super interesting. But fire is gonna need council and financial incentives to change their behavior to start implementing fire and quail is one of those vehicles that may get fire on the landscape. So the Working Lands for Wildlife program is one of those avenues that landowners can get assistance. Um, this top left map here in the southeast, any, any county you see in green, and I think this counties are being added to this in other states as well. Uh, landowners are eligible for, uh, you know, to apply for additional pots of money to burn for quail. And so I would recommend any private landowners or any practitioners that work with private landowners keep this program in mind. Uh, Jessica McGuire with Quail Forever uh, heads up that shop with Quail Forever where she supervises biologists all over the Southeast United States. I think uh, biologists are gonna be up, uh, put online here in, in Alabama as well. And so, there's technical service providers out there that can help landowners and also give them advice, but also uh, potentially provide some economic incentives as well. In addition to Quail Forever, I know Tall Timbers has recently hired John McGuire to head up their private land fire initiative. And this position, my understanding is to help break down barriers uh, to get more fire on the ground. Hopefully I've impressed upon you that Fire is super important for quail. And if we don't apply it on the ground, what I've told you here today is a bunch of uh, you know, academic nonsense. Uh, so folks like Tall Timbers, Quail Forever are super important to get this information in the hands of landowners so they can start uh, you know, using their own drip torch. So with that, I would like to acknowledge folks that contributed uh, to this talk and really to the research has been a lot of private landowners, Tall Timbers, obviously in RCS, the Working Lands for Wildlife Partnership in the University of Georgia. And I would just like to thank uh, Dave with, for inviting me to do this and I really appreciate these seminars that I think it gets a lot of good, good information out to a lot of different people. So with that, I guess I'll take some questions. All right, Dr. Martin, thank you so much. If y'all joined us during the presentation, my name is David Godwin and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange Program with the University of Florida. We just had a really fascinating presentation from Dr. James Martin with the University of Georgia. At this point in our program, we would like to provide an opportunity for you to ask questions. I know some folks have already put some things in there. Uh, we're gonna try and keep it uh, up until the top of the hour so that we can respect everyone's time. Uh, so if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A window. Uh, we have the opportunity through Zoom for you to vote for other questions. So, so look and see if there are questions uh, that have already been submitted and you think that those are um, really interesting. Give them a, a thumbs up vote and that'll help us to get to uh, as, as many uh, relevant questions as we can in the time we have remaining. I, I do want to say thank you so much for everybody who joined us today. Uh, this is our new record uh, for participation for our Southern Fire Exchange webinar. Uh, I, I wish that you all could see how many people we had on the line, but we've got over 370 folks uh, from all over the country and, and across the world uh, online today. And I think that is a testament, uh, Dr. Martin, to you know how much interest there still is in the Firebird, even almost a hundred years since uh, Herbert Stoddard came down to the Red Hills. Uh, folks are still I, fascinated I, in that bird. Absolutely. I guarantee it has nothing to do with me. It's all about the bird and I, I, I'll, I'll definitely uh, take that. 
All right, let's get to some of these questions. Uh, here's one that came in uh, and it says, you know, on, on these large scale burns, yep. would having a mosaic result in vegetation that would be uh, better for coil habitat? Yes. I, yes. I think they're trying to get to like a mosaic of fire effects. Could you talk about that? A absolutely. Um, if, yeah, if, if you're a, an artist and I, and I really think there's prescribed managers out, f prescribed fire managers out there that can burn, take a 2000 acre block of, of land and burn it in such a way that f it functionally operates like you burn 50 acres blocks across that area. There's people out there that can do that. Um, so yes, I think you can create a mosaic. However, I think you, if you wait for the perfect conditions to do that, you're likely going to have a very narrow window from a weather perspective. And if you miss that window, then you're, you're going to have to burn 2000 acres or you have to wait to the following year, which is way worse than not burning it at all. So yes, I think it can be done, but I think it can be somewhat of a trap. That's why I was, if possible, I would set out trying to make the burn blocks as small as possible from an operational perspective and go from there. And if you, it'll be icing on the cake if you can use the conditions to create mosaics on those larger burns. Hopefully I answered that question. Mm -hmm. Here's a somewhat similar question. Uh, and this is getting to that question of scale. Uh, but what are your thoughts on, on irregularly shaped uh, burn units you know if, if you have if you're not looking at a block but you had a unit that had a more variable shape with more edge uh, would there be a benefit to that there would be a marginal benefit to that um, i can say from my perspective of burning if it's shaped like a amoeba that's really hard to burn um, you know you can have cost you know simultaneously you can have backing fires, head fires, and flanking fires on the same burn block. Uh, so my experience is that a lot of prescribed fire practitioners don't like those irregular shaped burns. And from my perspective, as somewhat of a, as a novice, I don't like them either. So operationally, I would say I would avoid doing something like that. Uh, of course, the landscape, you know, it's gonna have natural contours and natural kind of edges and ecotones and take advantage of those. But I wouldn't set out to create uh, you know, irregular shape polygons. I had a question come in from Jim. Could you talk about uh, fire ants? Are they an important issue for quail in Georgia and Florida? Uh, not as important as a lack of fire. Um, so fire ants do uh, depredate quail nests and quail chicks, but at a really low rate, it's sort of surprising, even though they're super common in some areas, their predation rates on quail are fairly low. Uh, to, I, I won't, I'll never say never, but it's rare in my mind that in the southeast, again, east of Mississippi River, that fire ants would be the main limiting factor for quail. That would be my short answer to that question. Here's a question that came in uh, from, from Sasha. And Sasha was asking about, you know, are there any plant physiology indicators uh, that you've identified through your, work, through your work that would be a good marker for when to burn or, or to stop burning rather than focusing on the month? That's a great question. Well, in, in, if it's a wiregrass community, once that wiregrass lays over and you know, starts to develop that mat, then from a quail perspective, it needs to be burned. And in some places I've seen that might occur as frequently as or as soon as 18 months. Um, so that, that would be one easy example to provide. When, if you start to see plants, um, if you start to lose some of those annuals, the early colonizers like your uh, plume grass and uh, you know, some of your legumes, if you start losing those, if you see those not showing up, then it's, it's time to burn as well. So I would say when grasses start to become a mat, and then when you start to lose those legumes, that's an indicator to me that it's time to burn. And if your bare ground is less than say 25%. Yeah, 
Here's a question that came in from Jeff. It's a two part, but I want to hit on the second part. He, Jeff is asking, is the presence of Bahia grass uh, negative to uh, Bob White habitat? Yes. Uh, Bahia is not as bad as Bermuda. Uh, my first study area in central Florida, South Florida, in fact, in the Soda County was uh, Bahia grass Angus uh, operation. And quail can live on the fringe of situations like that, uh, where the Bahia grass is kind of mixed in with other native, with, with native grasses. But if you're dealing with a lot of Bahia, it's, it's, it's bad because one, quail can't get to the soil to access seeds, even though Bahia grass does produce a seed that quail would eat. It, it, it's no good to them if, if it's below that, that thatch. Uh, and then the mobility of chicks and Bahia grass, much like Bermuda, is, is poor as well. So if you're dealing with anything more than say five or 10% Bahia grass on any given parcel of land, then uh, I would say there, there's management needed to reduce Bahia grass. We'll get one more question in here as we're getting to the top of the hour. And this is also uh, part of that question from Jeff. And Jeff was asking about uh, arsenal, uh, but as, a, as its impact on forbs and legumes. But let me back that up just a little bit and say, mm -hmm. could you talk about uh, herbicides in uh, managing quail habitat? Yeah, absolutely. Her herbicides play a, a key role in the Southeast managing quail habitat today because of, you know, sort of the lack of burning and, and different land management practices, we have a lot more um, hardwood saplings, especially uh, sweet gum. You know, they're the cosmopolitan species in the Southeast these days. So herbicides are extremely important to recapture a site so that we can start reintroducing fire uh, in a particular stand. Hopefully, hopefully that once we do that first application of herbicide, fire can, can do the rest. So yes, herbicides are important, but there are no direct substitute for fire alone uh, because you cannot remove bare ground with a herbicide. You can create forbs, you can create grasses, you can create or, or shape the amount of shrub that you have, but I've yet to see a herbicide that would burn up litter. If so, somebody could make a lot of money. All right, well with that, it looks like we've run up the, to the end of our time today. If you would like to follow up with Dr. Martin, you can see his email address uh, on the screen. James, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your work and, and Steve as well. Uh, thank you for your partnership in making this webinar happen today. Appreciate you guys so much. and. Thank you everyone for joining us online and uh, we hope that this, use, this webinar will be useful in your fire management programs. Have a good afternoon. Thank you all.